give us a second to check the mic. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. I sound like Talk a Dracula or something. Was that Dracula? The good evening? Yes, I think so. That's Dracula. Okay, we're not. This happened last time. Yeah, and when I set it up today, I made sure. It's going to make that jarring. It is. There it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, Bob Knopfsinger's in the house. Everybody say hi to Bob. Hey, Bob. Hi, Bob. There's a lot of people that just said hi. There you didn't are, hear any of them. But. There are three Bobs in this study. Oh, that's true. <laughs> We've got three Bobs. The trifecta. We'll let the them. trinity of Bobs, if you will. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Okay. Well, good evening. Welcome to Bible study. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 5, once again, in the middle of the Sermon of the Mount. Um, but before we do, we're going to spend a little time in prayer, um, have kind of a, uh, a prayer request that just came to me about an hour ago. So, um, Doug Braddock is the name of the contractor who helped us build this beautiful building and is currently working with us to make plans for the new sanctuary, which he thought he was going to have ready by um, the end of next month. He had a heart attack today. No. He's stable now. Wow. They put a stent on the right side, and tomorrow he's getting a stent on the left side. Wow. And so... Um, you may not know Doug. Some of you remember Doug, who were here when we were building the building. Um, great man, great Christian man. I've gotten to know him just through meetings and stuff, and uh, he's a blessing to have to help us with these things. Um, very generous man, um, has donated things to us. But yeah, and the uh, and I've met his wife too, a uh, sweet woman, and she can't go in to see him. Imagine, um, some of you have already dealt with that, but wow. because of the hospital regulations, her husband just had a heart attack and wow. she can't be at his side. And so she's waiting, you know, in the waiting room of the hospital and just getting updates. So we want to pray for him and his recovery and for the surgery tomorrow, and then also pray for his wife. I don't know her name. Um, Mona. Mona. Okay, thank you so much. So we'll pray for Mona as well wow. to give her comfort and strength. And uh, and I'm sure there's family and, and stuff that can support her. But anyway, we want to pray for him. We've got our first responders, our uh, prayer team praying. And um, Chrissy Faulkner got some people to pray. But anyway, we want to be praying for Doug and Mona. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Also, with our uh, prayer points, we're praying that um, the church reunifies and the church um, no longer is in a pause pattern. We've we've talked about that from the pulpit and stuff, and we just want to be a church. Um, you know, when the pandemic first started, the first year, we were just well, let's wait till it's over and things will come back to normal, but. <clears throat> We can't just sit and wait anymore. We got to really look to be all we can be um, for the Lord now. Yep. And so that's a, we don't know what that's going to look like. We, we, know, we know things will look different um, until the world somewhat gets back to normal. But we are just looking for direction and how the Lord would do that. But the first thing is to kind of bring our hearts back into being the church we need to be and... Yep. Um, so we're praying for that. And then the third one we are praying, we've been going through our different ministries. We're praying for our women's ministry um, as they, they just had a great event. I heard great things, not to give you a big head, but um, <laughs> no, I will. But uh, uh, Kathy gave the devotional and I heard it was a really powerful and uh, just a really, from multiple people, Kathy, I heard they were blessed by it. So the Lord definitely used you in that. And so anyway, and we have a couple very large apples at our home that came <laughs> from there. So, And I've been told not to eat them. They're for cooking. I didn't realize there's apples you don't eat. You just cook. So They say they're too tart. I mean, it's huge, but uh, it's very tempting. I mean, I'm sure that's the size apple that was on the tree. Um, and they didn't know that was a cooking apple. So... <laughs> 
don't listen to anything I'm saying right now, uh, but uh, we're going to go into prayer. So, uh, Tanner, why don't you open and pray for Doug and Mona, and then I'll close with the prayer points. Great. Would you pray on your own individually as we, or just in spirit with us? But uh, Tanner, lead us this evening. God, thank you for bringing us here tonight, and we just want to bring our brother and sister, uh, Doug and Mona, to you. God, would you just be so close to Doug right now, um, both physically and mentally, as he is in many ways alone, um, without a lot of love and support to be there in person with him. God, we just pray for um, wisdom and precision with the doctors and the procedures and everything that needs to take place. God, as the great physician, we just ask for your healing, um, both right now and as he goes forward in recovery, um, that you would just bring him to the place where he needs to be to do the work that he loves. Um, but God, just um, grace as I'm sure it will be difficult for him to not get back right away. Um, so just everything around this, physically, mentally, spiritually for him, God, would you just be so close, put your healing touch upon him. And God, for Mona as well, I can't imagine the pain of not being able to be with your spouse in a moment like this. So God, we just pray that you would be so close to her as well, to lift her up, to strengthen her in all the ways that she needs, and that she would just have a great support system around her as well. And Lord, we just lift up your church here, Lord. And uh, Father, first and foremost, we recognize it's your church, Lord. And we want it to be what you desire it to be. And Father, we thank you so much for how you've helped our church weather this pandemic to this point, Lord. You've um, kept your people faithful, Lord. We've been supported. And there's so many other churches. Some have had to close because of the situation, Lord, but you've kept us healthy and alive and supported, Lord. So we thank you for that blessing. But Father, now as we look to uh, to be the church you need us to be, even now, Lord, in 2021 and 2022, and Father, help us not to um, just sit and wait, but to be the church now. And Lord, whatever we have to address in our own hearts, maybe we've been in a pause mode with church Father, let us just, uh, as individuals, as families, uh, as the people, the men and women of the body of Christ, Father, may we just unify and may those who have to continue online for health reasons, may they find ways to um, just have a spirit of being fully connected with the church, Lord. And may those who maybe have been watching online but can return, Father, just would you speak wisdom and direction to your people and let us be a people that will follow. Father, however you want us to engage the community, show us how to do that. If it's got to be different than we planned, Lord, make it different, but lead us, Lord. And uh, however you want us to do individual ministries right now, Father, just lead us, guide us, and let us be effective uh, for the kingdom. Let us be effective in discipling. Let us be effective in spreading the gospel. Let us be effective in loving people and loving this community, even while this is going on, Lord. So guide and direct in that. And with that, Lord, we are lifting up our women's ministry. Um, Father, let that be a conduit to bringing back the church that needs to be. Let the um, through that ministry, let the the just the fellowship and the discipleship and just the gathering together and the encouragement. And uh, from everything to events to secret sister, Lord, let just use it to be a blessing um, to for the enthusiasm of our women to be a part of a church. And uh, Lord, we ask that our women can set the example and, and be leaders in our church to show how Christians minister um, during a pandemic, Father. So we do ask a blessing on this Bible study tonight as we dig through the greatest sermon ever recorded. Lord, I pray that the truth of Jesus' timeless words just grab our hearts today. And whatever we need to gain through this, Lord, um, the fact that we're here seeking and ready to dig into your word, we just pray that you bless that and um, give us grace, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Amen. Amen. All right. We've got some viewers, but all I can see is Bob so far. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and we are at a part where Jesus is taking rules, commands from the Old Testament that at this point, God's people, the Jews, have really taken these rules and kind of found loopholes, found ways to abuse the rules, found ways to add to them in ways they weren't intended. And Jesus is getting back to the heart of why the rules are there. And more specifically, Jesus, instead of just focusing on don't do this, Jesus is focusing on your thoughts and heart that lead to breaking commandments. You know, murdering someone is breaking a commandment. But really, if you've arrived at the point where you are going to go kill somebody, you have already sinned in your heart because you've given in to this desire. You were tempted with hatred or anger. But Jesus is saying, let's talk about, you know, you've heard, do not murder, but I say, love your enemy. So Jesus is not just only addressing it, but Jesus is giving the solution. You know what? If you love your enemy, you're never going to get to this point where you're breaking this commandment. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been covering so far. Um, we've talked about, um, um, a, we, first we started with murder. And then we're in this section right now. The first was adultery, and Jesus did it again. He said, "There's don't commit adultery, but I tell you, and Jesus is speaking with an authority not even the prophets had. The prophets would say, God tells you this. Mm -hmm. The rabbis would say, the scriptures tell you this. Jesus is saying, I tell you this. And with adultery, Jesus is saying, hey, if any of you are looking at someone with lustful thoughts, you know, there's the temptation, the attraction, but lust is where you give in to that temptation. Jesus said, if you're thinking this, you've committed adultery. It's not, you know, just because your plans to enact it haven't worked out yet, the fact that your heart is there giving in to lust for someone, you've committed adultery. So Jesus, it's just, that's what all of these are. And so we're going to continue um, with Jesus doing that. And now the second part of the adultery, Jesus is going to address divorce. Um, and he's going to start it off, he's going to set it up with um, verse 29, which is, it's one of these things where Jesus uses hyperbole. He exaggerates a little bit, but he exaggerates so you clearly hear the truth. So Tanner, um, why don't you read 29 for us? If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out throw it away it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell and read 30 and if your right hand causes you to stumble cut it off throw it away it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell okay so pretty violent i mean if we took this literally that what we were talking last week, there'd be a lot of one-eyed people, a lot of Popeyes coming to church, <laughs> and a lot of maimed people um, coming to church. Um, but um, Jesus hits this illustration's perfect because he's still addressing the two things. So he starts with your right eye, and in this day and age, um, your right whatever was the more valuable. Everyone was right-handed. You didn't just be born a left-handed back then. You weren't supposed to use your left hand. I know today some of you think left-handers are weird and stuff, but any left-handers in here? Oh, we got one. <laughs> but certainly today, you know, left hand, right hand, it's just kind of a fun thing, but it's nothing important. But in this day, you used your right hand because everybody used your right hand. And wow. so that's what this culture is used to so there was even thought that you use your right eye your right eye was causing you to focus more on what you're looking at weird thought <laughs> but so the right eye is the most useful and what you focus on most so if your main eye your right eye is focusing on something 
that is leading to sin, Jesus say, hey, it's better to gouge it out. It's better to end what you're focusing on. Basically, what he's saying with his hyperbole, it's better you to change your life so that you can no longer see that, you know, make real decisions. And, um, and make a change to help you not have those thoughts. And Jesus is doing the same thing here because the next time he says, um, with your right hand, if your right hand is causing you to sin and your right hand is that which you're interacting with, if I'm going to get in a fight with Tanner and lash out with anger, as a Jew, I'm going to be using my right hand and to punch. <laughs> um, and if that's causing me to sin, cut it off. And do you see the progression? An eye is focusing your mind on something. That's the thoughts. Your hand is then acting on your thoughts and cut that off. So Jesus is again dressing if something, if your thoughts are causing you to sin, make a change so that you can no longer focus on that. If you're, if you focused on it and now you're actually acting out, make a change so that you can no longer act it out. So it's the same thoughts versus action that Jesus is trying to get to the people. Um, what are what are examples of ways one can help them change what their mind is focusing on? What are practical ways a Christian, if their mind is struggling with, with focusing on anger, focusing on jealousy, focusing on envying what other people have, focusing on lust, focusing on um, just unforgiveness or anger. If a Christian is just having trouble, they keep thinking about this. What are practical ways to help us gouge out our eye? This is pretty violent. I'm thinking, <laughs> anybody see Terminator way back in the day? Remember when he has to change? Okay, Caleb remembers. <laughs> He's all, yes, I remember that scene. That disturbed me as a little kid. I don't know why I was watching that. But anyway, so how can, uh, what are practical ways a Christian can do to change what their mind is focusing on. An accountability partner. Oh yeah, an account, um, Corey said an accountability partner, someone you can go to that you trust, you have that relationship with. This is what I'm struggling with, and they can be an, um, keep you accountable, encourage you. Absolutely, that's great. What What are other ways Christians change what we're focusing on? Meredith said it's kind of hard to read through the Bible and feel okay with sinful thoughts. Mm -hmm. Certainly, going to the Word, um, and you know, and sometimes you are dealing with something mentally. You go to the Word, and it may not take it all away, but it 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 re kind of just refocuses you to deal with it. Sometimes I could testify it takes it away. You know, Uh, Mm -hmm. it just. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we're still we still deal with it, but we're dealing with it in a different way. And sometimes it just takes the thoughts and the, especially if it's a temptation to be jealous, to be angry, to you know, it, we, it disarms us. You know, mm-hmm. that's a good way. Yeah, that's great. What other ways can we refocus our mind? Accountability partner, the word. Yes. Praying. You, you just said two huge ones. Um, Becky said praying is a big one. Um, and, you know, we've been focusing on prayer and our preaching, you know, all summer. Mm-hmm. And certainly different of those focuses deals yeah. with struggling with sin. But praying and renewing your mind that way. Oh, yeah. um, I had a teacher in high school. I always remember because a lot of times when you are struggling with sin in your life, sometimes the approach is just stop sinning. I've just got to stop doing it. And she said, if you really want to stop sinning, it's more about your relationship with God in the first place. So she challenged, she would challenge people, pray as much as you possibly can during the day. 
pray as often as you can when you're driving, when where, wherever you're at, pray as often as you can and watch how the more you're praying, the more when you're in those moments that you've always been tempted and always struggled with, even in the heat of the moment when it's anger or something like that, the more you're just abiding with Christ, as Jesus says, the less likely you are to be captured either in your mind or your action. Absolutely. Sometimes it's hard, like when I fight so many little diablos all day long, just, you know, situations, history. And night, sometimes, you know, you just have vivid dreams. Right. It's like you literally wake up. Like I've woke up so many times exhausted from my dream. Yeah. Right. It's exhausting. It's, like, it's not your choice, not obviously. Choice. Right. It's, Talking about know, dreams. Trevor, could be subconscious in his brain all day long and you don't realize that yeah. you go to sleep and then yep. like, you have all this coming at you and it's like you're not purposely trying to think that way. Yeah. It's, I think both dreams and just. That's really draining for me. Yeah. What I find also draining, very closely related, is even before you fall asleep. A scenario, let's say you got into a difficult situation with someone and it ended badly and it just repeats in your mind. And man, I have had to just pray and pray and Lord deliver me. And, you know, and it it's what you're saying. It's exhausting. You know, you just to the point where you're almost more vulnerable because you're exhausted, you know. Um, but I do find if we stay in the Lord, he will be faithful and Sometimes we may have a sleepless night or two, but it's worth it to see him then put his hand in the situation and and deliver us from it. Um, and sometimes it's separating us from it. And sometimes it is is harmony. Um, Michelle put um, self admonition, um, disciplining yourself, reminding yourself this is not what Jesus teaches, and and really just kind of kind of an inward reminder. Um, and certainly that was great um oh and she put and she likes to put on a worship song reset my mood that that is a great thing mm -hmm. and we all may have different worship songs i've learned that when i hear hill song in the other room to stay away from care right. <laughs> <laughs> not always but see that would get me in a worse mood. no just kidding just kidding no i i do like hill song but uh, no, I was kidding. Hillsong worship. Um, Sometimes it's a matter of changing your habits. Yeah. I know I'm tempted when I go by the liquor store, change my route. Right. Go to the liquor store. That goes, that I would help. say, more with the next question, because we're talking about the eye and the thoughts, mm -hmm. which that could be too, because sometimes just visual triggers. Yeah. The next thing I was going to ask, how... What are examples of a way a Christian can help change their actions, what they're doing? And certainly, um, the example is, if you're struggling with alcohol, don't drive by the liquor store. And I think that um, is a firm example of how we can change our actions. Any other suggestions with changing our actions? Um, you know... Right. Or not being with that right. There's a group of people that promote you to act, whether it's peer pressure or just being a part of the group, not being with those groups. Um, you know, the difficulty is when you're forced to be around them, like if it's work yeah. or something. I yeah. mean, I think I mean. there are some. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some situations where you can remove someone from their work if you're their boss. <laughs> There's some situations where you might be called because of what the damage is causing in your life. If it's causing too much anger or resentment, you may need mm -hmm. to give up a job and mm -hmm. deal with whatever strain that puts on you till you find a new job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it may not be that extreme. Sometimes it may be a matter of talking to your employer and I need space from this person. We, I want it to work. Um, or if maybe you've never really sat down one-on-one -on -one with the person and tried to humbly deal with it, mm. maybe it's just always been that person drives me crazy, you know? And so 
Um, is it actually that person or is it you? What's that? Yeah. Is it actually that person or is it you? Yeah. Is it actually that person that we're so convinced of or is it our, our own self that's causing the conflict? That's great. And uh, certainly even with actions, reading the Bible, praying, some of these work for both. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes we can make changes. Um, I've counseled um, a lot of um, teenagers, uh, males, college males, uh, as far as dealing with pornography and things like that. And there's some s small but very effective methods, you know, wherever your computer is, angle it so that when someone comes in the room, they can see the monitor, you know, keep your door open when you do your homework, you know, just little thing. If you're really serious about making changes to this behavior, mm -hmm. there are small things that can really change the action. And, and that, you know, and that goes for any struggle we have. There's small things that um, can really make a difference. Um, and I think both are important. I had a friend who struggled a lot with pornography in high school as well. And I would suggest like those kinds of tips. And he said, well, it's, it's really the problem is with my relationship with the Lord. I just need to be close with Jesus and then it will take care of those other things. <laughs> I'm like, well, why not both? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Why not be closer to Jesus? I'm not close to Jesus because I'm giving into sin, <laughs> but I, I need to get close yeah. to Jesus and I'll deal with that later. But like, it's like, you got, it's both. Yeah, I, which, know, it's, it's cool. I like the way you're described. I've never heard the background of the eye and the right hand like that. The, right. the mental the mental game and the physical game. It's That's a right. two-part beast. And you think about that struggle you have, that relationship struggle, that work struggle, that temptation for whatever it is, if we think of it in terms of what do I need to do to get my mind right? What do I need to keep me from, you know, and it's not just your hand, keep my mouth from saying what the saying, you know, the mental and the physical um, or the flesh. I know a lot of times we hear the flesh, we think um, sexual in the Bible, but no, uh, the flesh is just everything related to just our earthly nature. And so how can we hit those on two fronts? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think sometimes one can disarm the other and vice versa. Yeah, you know, no so. question. Um, good discussion, great discussion. So let's move on then. Jesus then sets up divorce. And I talked about calling Tanner, people. Um, <laughs> um, in a nutshell, the Old Testament was a patriarchal society. In other words, the man was the total head of the household. And we have to be careful not to say, well, that's wrong, because we think about today, we think about the equality today, we think about if a... Um, if a man dies, we have systems in our society like welfare, like um, it, health insurance, life insurance, um, retirements, things like that, that protect people from being very vulnerable. But in the Old Testament days, the most vulnerable woman or the most vulnerable person was a widow. Um, and a lot of the, the patriarch setup actually was giving the man um, the, um, responsibility. the responsibility. We talked a little bit about the marriage vows. The marriage vows back then were totally different than what we do today. Marriage vows back then included, you will give a home to this woman for the rest of your life. You will provide food and shelter forever. You cannot, if you break these vows, you have to pay everything. You know, there was a big dowry that was paid to the man when he married. You have to pay everything back and the wife could have the, the marriage nullified if you weren't living up to your marriage vows. You were like on the hook financially, spiritually, everything. And so even though we look at it today and, you know, that isn't a model for us today, but in the time, in this very um, society where you have people all around you that can enact war at any time, this was a plan of God to keep his people together 
and to keep his people alive to get to Jesus Christ. And so there's certain things that God does not, and Jesus makes adjustments that led into today that are appropriate for today. So it's just important to remember it was a different time, a different plan for those people at the time. But with a divorce, um, a woman could not divorce a man unless he was not fulfilling vows. Um, and then she could get someone to bring it to a magistrate, a judge, and they would end the marriage. So there was a way for her to get out, but um, he had to live up to those marriage vows. But a, a man could um, give a certificate of divorce. And even in the Old Testament, it had to be an official. You could not just, I'm done with you, leave. Like it was a big deal. And we're going to learn something about God and how sometimes he does things because of our weakness. And I can testify to that. God puts up with Brent's weaknesses. God also put up with the weaknesses of his people. Um, and so that's what we're going to read about today. Um, what And what Jesus is getting at is something very relevant in the world today. People in Jesus' day, men were divorcing women for any cause. Just any reason. If they wanted to get a divorce, they would come up with a reason, have the certificate. If there was another woman they wanted to marry, um, because at this point in Jesus' day, having more than one wife was not common and was looked down on. But if I want to change who I'm married, I'm just going to come up. If, if we're just... Man, we fight a lot, whatever, you know, and today we live in a society where it really doesn't take much for someone to say, well, I'd be happier, you know, away from this person. And, and many of us, many of us in the church, um, we have, we have divorce in the church and people have been healed and forgiven. And, um, sometimes there's people in the church where it was not their fault why a person left them. Sometimes it was them that, initiated the divorce and God forgives and heals, but we got to understand God's plan for divorce. So let's first look at, um, if you want to flip back to Deuteronomy, um, we're going to look at the verse in Deuteronomy 24 verse one. Um, and this is, there's some interesting parts to this verse, but this is kind of where the certificate of divorce came into play under Moses's leadership. But go ahead and read that, Tanner. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, give it to her and sends her from his house. Okay. So it's that word indecent is a very, very heavy word in the Hebrew. It, it's in fact, I think the NIV could have picked... Does anybody have a different word there in their translation? Or we all got NIVs because we know well, that's what the bald guys one. use. Um, 24 verse 1. Um, the message says no longer likes her or no longer liked her because he has found something wrong with her. Okay, okay. The, the, so if we took it really literal... It, uncleanliness. Oh, uncleanliness. That hits, I think, a little bit truer... To the mark, um, and so the um, basically, if we took it literal, it says if a man finds in her nakedness, and it's not talking about just her not being clothed. It's talking about when you strip everything away in her inner self. In you know, when we talk about the the Eve or Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, when they realized they were naked, they covered themselves, but it wasn't about nakedness. It, they were hiding a sin. That And God's like, who told you that you needed to cover? Who told you you're naked? Who told you you had to, you're hiding from me? Who who did this? And he, God knew, but he wanted them to go through this confession time. But that's that's when when the Old Testament says nakedness, it's, I am bare and my faults are bare. And so what this really gets at and what the original message from Moses was, if you see something that is unclean 
and we're talking spiritually, we're talking, or it could be physically, you know, adultery or something like that. But it is, if there is something about this person that is when in, in, in their inner self that is unclean, you know, um, there was some intermarrying sometimes with conquered people. And the Bible was very clear. Everyone has got to serve Yahweh within God's people. But we all know idols always found their way to creep in. And so if you marry someone and all of a sudden you find her hidden idol collection because she hasn't let go of where she came from, that religion, that would be the example <laughs> in her nakedness. You are finding something that is unclean in the Lord's eyes. That's the original intent of the message. But over years and decades, it became more like what the NIV says. If you find something you don't like about her, um, you know, that is an excuse to divorce your wife. And that is what Jesus, and you're going to see the example of the reaction of the disciples to Jesus' teaching. It's really clear. Um, so what we're going to do is, there's not enough here, teaching here. If we're going to talk about divorce, I really want to go to what Jesus says later in Matthew. So let's go back to Matthew. And, um, and I think it's good for all of us to have a clear understanding of the biblical teaching of divorce. Yeah. And well, the, something people argue yes. about. In a previous church, there was a huge point of contention over this passage. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've seen what, we always have to remember what Jesus is dealing with. What Jesus is dealing with is people divorcing, uh, going through divorce for frivolous reasons, for reasons they're just getting divorced because they want to end the marriage. Um, and it's just there are they are casually in, ending marriage. Yeah. And that is what Jesus wants to put a stop to. And so let's go to uh, Matthew 19. And we're going to start with verse 3. Let me bring this up. Do you want me to just read the whole passage? Or? Yeah. I, I want you 3 through 12 yep. is what we're going to read. Okay. Go for it. All right. 19, 3 through 12. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So <laughs> that there shows the problem. You got to remember the the most common trap the Pharisees would give Jesus is we're going to give you something that the people all want and that scripture might say something different. And we want to make we want you to make someone mad or we want you to go against the Bible. It was the same thing. Hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar? If Jesus says yes, the people are going to get crazy if, and, and revolt and be upset at Jesus. If Jesus says no, the Roman guards are going to hear about this. And so it's the kind of trap. So these Pharisees know this crowd. There are a lot of men who have divorced for any and every reason. And they stand on that because... The, the religious rulers of the time have allowed them to do this. They had to sign the certificate of divorce. And so they're signing it for any other reason. And so they're testing Jesus. So this is what Jesus is dealing with. Go. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Jesus is going before the divorce law was made mm. by Moses. So, G and this is where Jesus just always has the wisdom how to deal with this. Jesus is going back to the creation of time. I'm getting ready to do a wedding in um, Eagle, Idaho. Anybody been to Eagle, Idaho? It's right next to Boise. I'm this Saturday, and I will be reading these words at one time. Um, but Jesus is, uh, he's just, Going back to Genesis here, the Creator made a male and female and come together and they will be one flesh. V verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. All us pastors say that at, at the wedding. You've it's heard required. Us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but what a powerful statement yeah. uh, and an anti divorce statement to say. Basically, yep. we're saying, hey, this is intended to be final. This isn't yep. just 
Um, I, I, um, my college student was watching The Office today at home, and there was a guy on there who was like, this is what I believe in. My ex-wife knows it, my current wife knows it, and my next wife will know it too. Like, he says that line, and it's just, and I was laughing because I'm all, that is the exact opposite, but it was kind of the thought in Jesus' day, and that is some people's thoughts in today's day and age as no well. Question. Okay? Why then, they, the Pharisees asked, the trap reveals itself, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it, is not, it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So, um... Jesus is saying, this is not how it was designed. God allowed Moses to do it because he had to keep... You remember how obnoxious these people were <laughs> in Exodus in the desert, and they just whined and whined and whined. It felt like a road trip with our kids. Am I right, Caleb? They're just whining. When are we going to do? I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. This is, you know. And Moses did not have a good job of keeping people together and one thing to keep God's people together, Moses, there were certain things God did. God's original design was not to give them a king, but the people begged and begged, and God, in an effort to keep them unified, gave them a king. And there were good kings that kept them unified, and there were bad kings, as God warned them. And God's like, now you got to deal with the consequences of this. But so God met the people where they were at and sometimes we have hard hearts aren't you thankful god has the grace to meet us where we're at and deal with us in a way not as he truly desires but as he desires so we don't lose our faith and he can bring us along and they um, god allowed divorce to happen but originally it was supposed to be for the same moral reasons that Jesus is getting to. But Jesus is, remember, Jesus is addressing, can we get divorced for any reason whatsoever? And Jesus says, I'm telling you, if you divorce your wife with the exception of sexual immorality and go and marry another woman, you are committing adultery. And one thing, and I think this causes some conflict in churches, a lot of people take verse nine and make it two separate actions. Yeah. And that is not what Jesus is dealing with. Jesus is dealing with people getting divorced so they can marry another woman. And, um, or one thing that also happened then, remember a man could divorce a woman if there was a deep uncleanliness about her. There's something deeply um, sinful. Now, women in those days sometimes wanted divorce so they can marry someone else as well. And they can't get divorced, but they can certainly become something that a husband would no longer desire and push the husband to then have the divorce, which was easy to do in those days. And so there is some responsibility with women. It was more a man patriarch as they were leading. But the idea is what people were doing in this day, I'm divorcing so I can get a new wife. And I think sometimes people, and I've heard some people who separate these two and think if you got a divorce, regardless if Jesus has healed that situation, forgiven who was ever at fault, and then take this verse and say, and now you can never get married again. And that's not what Jesus was addressing right here. Jesus is addressing, you cannot get a divorce and go and marry another woman because you're committing adultery. You're basically, um, you found a way to go sleep with another woman instead of the woman you married yeah. that you should not divorce. And so this is a continual action of divorcing so that you can go and be with someone else. And so... Um, Jesus is addressing it. Jesus says, you know what? You cannot break the knot that you tied together um, as man and woman coming as one flesh. You cannot break the knot to go be with someone else, but sexual immorality, when you commit adultery, Jesus said, 
he's quoting Genesis. It makes sense why this is Jesus' example of why you can be divorced because he said man and women will do what? Become one flesh. You commit adultery, you are no longer one flesh. You have joined flesh with another. So it makes sense that this is Jesus' example here that ruins the one flesh. Now, one common criticism is, well, this is the only example Jesus gave. Well, this is the example, this is the only example Jesus gave referring to this problem and the one fleshness of marriage. Some critics of the Bible say, well, the Bible, if, you, if a man's abusing their wife, they can't get a divorce because Jesus didn't say, didn't say abuse and stuff like that. Well, that's trying, you're not looking at what Jesus is addressing right here. And um, certainly we have more instructions in marriage than this. We are, the man is supposed to love his wife like Christ loves the church. If you are abusing your wife, you are so far from that that you are completely living opposite a, a sinful marriage. And the Bible, there are times when, when one person is choosing sin as opposed to God, Paul says, you can let that husband go or, or let that wife go. And so there's more to this. I truly don't believe if there is a, if there is physical abuse. And, and now I do think that there are some very, very tough situations in marriage. We are called to remain married, pray for God, especially if it's two believers. We've got to give it over to the Lord and God can heal anything. He is the great healer. And I've heard in some marriages where, um, well, in, in church with Christians, like one wife, their, their husband had been an alcoholic at one time and they were relapsing about eight years into their marriage. And she came to me and said, well, my husband has been drinking again. It's not bad yet, but I know it will be. And this is just like he's committing adultery on me. So I want to seek divorce. And it was like, wait a minute. That is not great. You know, you can't make Jesus say something he didn't. And clearly your husband, need, you know, it, and so the, the, the conversation quickly changed, but she, it, she was almost doing what the people of this day want to do. Let's find a loophole to do what I want to do. And, you know, there are parts of marriages that can be very, um, we need the perseverance and the hope and the, the support of the Lord and others. But there are some situations where sin has so taken over one of the parties that there is no way to have the marriage God desires anyway. And then it, we can't judge. We've got to let that between, go between the Lord and the person. Um, yes. Bye. Anybody that's been married at least 10 years is still together because of God's intervention. No. <laughs> okay. That's a good point. Tom says anyone who's been together 10 years... God has clearly kept them together. So, but but that is true. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> good job. Was that the good job, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, and then listen to this. Jesus says, "I tell you, anyone divorces wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery." You want to know how much this was happening in the disciples' day? Look at the disciples' response in verse 10. Read it. The disciples said to him, If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. <laughs> Think about that. The disciples say, If you can't just divorce her to go marry someone else, What's the point? What's the point of even being... That's how mess... We think it's so bad today. We Sometimes we got to look at the scripture and realize how... Things don't change sometimes, you know. Um, and, and then Jesus says this, and this, this is powerful words, and I don't want to get off topic, but we have talked in church lately about sexual immorality, um, 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 sexual relationships that God is not in God's plan. This next part, to me, speaks more on that than any other scripture in the Bible. Jesus replied, verse 11, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs. Now, a eunuch is someone that is unable to have a sexual relationship, either to create children or at all. There were different <laughs> levels in Jesus' day. 
but it is someone who is unable, let's just say, unable to have a romantic relationship. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. So some it wasn't their choice. Some it was put upon them, whether it was punishment or payment or whatever. And there are those who choose. This is the powerful verse I was talking about. There are those who choose to live like eunuchs with no romantic love for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. And so Jesus is saying, you know what? There are some people that the temptation to have multiple women and stuff is so great for the sake of God and the kingdom of heaven, they're choosing to give up a romantic relationship. And Jesus is acknowledging and commending people who do that. And that's where it relates. We can live a life, whatever the reason we need to give up a romantic relationship, we can do that for the kingdom of heaven. And so, um, but it's just, it cracks me up the disciples, man, it's better not to marry if those are the rules. And it's like, we're saying these are such basic rules. You can't just get divorced and remarry someone. So um, anyway, yes, Bob. Uh, the, uh, that's very clear uh, what you're saying. I, I've never uh, really thought of it that way. I'm, mm. I'm actually afraid that I'm, could I find out what really is measured? And this is, this is very uh, Good. Uh, opening my opening. My question is, this man that divorced somebody and he wanted to marry somebody else because he wanted to marry somebody else, he waits 10 years and it, it never happened. But uh, then 10 years later, not because of the divorce, but because he wants to be married, he finds this wonderful woman that he... Right, and right. He's committing the seventh uh, uh, commandment uh, adultery in doing that? Well... This is now a natural thing that is permitted. So... In this day, my first question would be, where's his wife or his former wife that he divorced? Is she still alone? Is she, can that, can there be restitution there? If she's remarried and moved on, and like you're saying, this 10 years, see, with our relationship with Jesus, he died for our sins. He's forgiven us for that sin. I've even heard in a church where it was, these passages were almost described like you will never be forgiven if you remarry and that go there's only one unforgivable sin listed in this bible and so if your sin has forgiven and we've been made pure of that then just like we're given new life and start anew if by the prompting of the lord a new relationship that is of the lord and a reuniting there there's new starts for the believer that's my personal belief and faith that's the uh and i know not that this means more than that but our denomination supports that as well um you know because you know and it's something our denomination has to be clear on because there are pastors that have had spouses leave them you know mm -hmm. and um, a good a good man, I just saw him when I went to California. He was a retired pastor in my last church. And in the 70s, he went into ministry. And after one year of ministry, his wife decided she did not want to be married to a pastor. It was a life that she didn't want to be a part of. And she left. Like he came home and the note was there. And in those days... And I'm sure the further you go back, it was like a scarlet letter he had. And he couldn't find another lead pastor position right away and ended up going as an associate pastor, you know. But it was just, those were the days. And and these days, you know, if, if God forbid, um, I'm not even going to use myself, that's horrible. <laughs> but if a pastor... A lead pastor of the Nazarene Church in Lebanon. No, I know him. Okay, so a Nazarene Church, uh, if, if, uh, if a pastor has their wife leave them, you know, not that they left, you know, but if they had a wife leave them, let's say the wife had an affair and ran off, there is a restoration process where they can still be involved in church ministry, but because of the weight of what they've yeah. gone through, they do want to remove them from the leadership position, but support them and get them through it, a restoration process where they can have counseling, um, spiritual um, counseling, and make sure that they're able to continue without 
certainly if anger or hurt is held on to, that could affect your ministry. So um, we believe in the restoration with that. But I hope that kind of answers what your question is. So, um, But certainly there are people that really take, like I said, they take that verse like verse 9 and then they separate it and they say if this happens and then this happens even if it's 10 years down the road they're not seeing that it's a related process and, and elsewhere in the bible it, it just says hey if uh, if uh they also say that if a if a man divorces his wife and then someone comes in and takes advantage of that situation well the new man who came in and scooped up that wife you're it's like you're putting your stamp of approval on what this guy just did and you are committing adultery by taking advantage of that situation. Again, that's not talking what you're talking about, two separate acts, but in this day, I'm divorcing this woman to go over here, and then I, oh, she's prettier than my wife, I'm gonna divorce you, and now I'm gonna jump, you know, and it's just, it's just all adultery, so. Brian, yes. Uh, well, speaking of adultery, uh, Luke 16, 18, for everyone who, Divorces his wife like you've been talking about. Right. Uh, marries another, commits adultery, and is divorced from uh, a husband, commits adultery. Right. So, right. so, so, and, and that's saying that if you, if you uh, uh, say you're tired of that person or whatever, yep. you go out and remarry just because you want to go out and do, do whatever, yeah. then you're... It's right adultery, away, yeah. You're, you're, Even if you're married, yeah. it's adultery. And that's the same teaching yeah, here. Because, yeah. because uh, you're, you're, you're bound oath to God when, once you've, you've married. Absolutely, absolutely. You're, back to what's in your heart. you're, you're right, <laughs> yep. you're right. And that's what Jesus, Jesus is saying, forget these loopholes you found. We're mm -hmm. getting back to the intent and the heart, you know, and that's why... Before this time, hey, if I've remarried, I'm married, I can't commit adultery while I'm married. Yes, you can because of your heart. So, um, yeah, that's absolutely it. So, um, hopefully, um, you know, from creation, we were designed man and woman to be one flesh, and we want to maintain that. So, um, okay. Enough we got through. <laughs> okay, you've got 19 minutes or so, <laughs> or, or less. <laughs> so let's go on to oaths. That, it, it's weird. We we murder, adultery, divorce, and now oaths. I know, but I it's just... not like Jesus is switching to talking to just the teenagers or something. Like this is the truth of this is hangs i think there's a kind of a thing like we've dealt with the real important ones now let's deal with the lesser no jesus is including this right there so the truth of this is going to be as relevant as the truth of the other yeah. so yeah i was sitting here like man that was a powerful <laughs> section and discussion on divorce now we're going to talk about oaths okay <laughs> um but like you said the the heart of what the issue is here is very important and i would say maybe even more applicable to the average Christian than those murdering. Deuteronomy chapter 5 says, Do not quench the spirit. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Let's uh, go. Back to Matthew 5 now. Uh, 30, we're going to be 33 through 37. Um, go ahead and just read verse 33 and 34. All right. First, hello, Dave and Judy. I saw that you're watching. Welcome. Um, <laughs> So, thir just 33? 33 and 34. Okay. Again, you have heard that it was said, we've gotten a lot of these, to the people long ago, and we talked about last week that Jesus is probably speaking to a more uneducated crowd here. And yep. I love that Jesus didn't just speak to the rich, wealthy. Like He went to the crowds that didn't get the formal training. And just the way he words it, you know, mm -hmm. um, um you know, I've always been very clear. Or one thing I've always done, because um, I heard another pastor kind of talk to me about it, like whenever you deal with familiar passages or familiar stories, never say to the crowd, well, you know the story about this, because there may be new believers who don't know that story. You don't want to make them feel, oh, I don't get it like everyone else. Mm -hmm. But you mm -hmm. always take the time to, to just everyone where they're at. And so... 
you know, the educated people, Jesus would have said, you know that it says in this portion of whatever, but here he's saying, you know, you heard it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Now that's a good thing. Don't break your oath, but if you've made a vow, it's like you're fulfilling it to the Lord. But um, I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven. Now this is, so these are the new things people are doing. Um, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. Just read the whole section. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I move on. Okay. Keep, no, keep going. Or by the earth, for it is his footstool, footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So these are all things that people are swearing by. I swear by heaven. I swear by earth. I swear by Jerusalem. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Yeesh. So he says, <clears throat> you heard that it was said. Now this is the one, the first two that we talked about, murder and adultery. You know, those were flat out passages clear in the Old Testament. This one is kind of a combination of some Old Testament ideas or a summary right. of don't break your oath, fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. Now the idea of not breaking your oath is it was a failure to do what one is promised to do under oath. Pretty self-explanatory. If you are giving an oath, going to do something, you don't do it. That's what breaking your oath is. So Jesus says, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by all of these things. And so why does Jesus say don't, like what, why is this, as Brent said, listed right after murder and adultery? Why is this such a big deal that Jesus is saying, actually, don't make any oaths at all, either by heaven, by God, or all of these things? If you think about it, maybe you've had a person in your life, or you've been the person who is constantly saying, I, I swear that I'll do it, I, I swear that I will, whatever they're swearing to. Someone who is constantly making oaths, constantly saying, I swear I will do this, a lot of times the first thought you have is, I, I trust you less now that you are constantly <laughs> saying, I Why do you swear have to that, add that? that yeah. I'm going to do <laughs> That's that. A good point. You know, and so it's just this idea of questioning someone's legitimacy of their commitment. And like I said, a big assumption behind someone making oaths constantly is, maybe they're not going to be fulfilling that oath. Or for the person constantly making oaths, constantly swearing, maybe in their mind, and we'll be led to believe with those people that if they're not swearing then, are they really going to stick to that commitment? Do they only stick to things when they swear? Your mother's grave, that, that doesn't mean... Michelle, <laughs> yeah, Michelle just put, we have heard people swear by evil things, their parents' graves, the lives of their kids. And yeah, so you thought the same thing. Yeah, you hear that quite often. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it just causes so many problems. You get to the mentality of, well, I didn't make an oath about it, so I'm just going to do whatever I want. And, and real quick, I want to say that come to my mind, we want to look at the definition of a, what is an oath, you know, because, you, you know, other than what you said, but because, you, you know, oaths could be looking at so many different ways, too. It could, and uh, Yeah, we'll get to that for sure. I, yeah. And, and that's why I, I say that because right. maybe some people have made many oaths that they didn't know they made and they're just thinking, well, God, I, I might do this today, I might do that tomorrow, I might do it ne next day, but in you. And, and they said all these things, but right. they didn't know they were making oaths. Well, an oath essentially here is anything beyond saying yes or no. Yep. It's having to add something that validates what you're saying. Yep. And so that's really what they're getting at. Yep. And so it causes problems just relationally in a, in a community where you say, well, I didn't make an oath. I didn't really commit to it. You, we just watched Charlie Brown um, Halloween or, or The Great Pumpkin, Charlie <laughs> Brown. Um, and where Charlie Brown wants to kick the football, Lucy right. constantly pulls it away from him, and she's like, well, I have a signed document that says I will not <laughs> pull the football away. Obviously, she pulls the football, and she says, well, it was never notarized. Yeah. So <laughs> it wasn't really an official 
kind of she thing. She wasn't under oath. So. So, <laughs> just like the murder, just like the adultery, Jesus is stepping back and saying, what is in the heart? What is in your intentions? Because just like murder and adultery break down community, break down human relationship, when you are not a trustworthy person, it, when the words that you are saying don't mean what is in your heart, that is a problem as well, or someone who will only tell the truth when they're under oath. Right. Um, so, well, is Jesus saying, never make an oath at all, you can never do it? Well, it's interesting, because if you turn over to Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, I assure you before God that I am what I am writing to you is no lie. And that is a, that is a variation of I swear to God. I assure you before God. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do we think, Brent? Is Jesus saying what, literally no oaths at all? Or the what's important going on? thing there is the nature of the mm-hmm. oath that Paul is doing. Paul yeah. is standing on the gospel he's preaching, and he's standing on his calling from God. He's getting challenged that he's an apostle. Yeah. He's just standing on Jesus' gospel, and he's standing on his calling from God. And these are things that Jesus said, the Spirit and God testify with Christ too. Mm -hmm. You know, remember that? Jesus said that the testimony of three, I have my Father and the Spirit testify to it. So here, and I'm not trying to make a loophole at all, but here it is appropriate for God to be the witness for Paul in his calling and in the gospel that Jesus is preaching. Mm -hmm. That's different than, I swear to God, I looked for bananas, Denise, at the store, or, (laughs) hey, even something more serious. You know, I I paid that bill, I, I swear to God. Those aren't things that God needs to testify for us. God needs us to just be honest and truthful and for people to know we're telling the truth. But if there is something where we need God to testify, it's when we say God has moved. I, you know, if it's something that, you know, the words of God, often we say we're standing on the Bible. That's essentially what Paul is saying. Where, you know, we stand on the Bible and that is almost like saying, we swear to the Bible that this is truth. You know what I'm saying? And so Paul is using God for a witness to God's words and God's calling. And that is appropriate as opposed to, I want to convince you that I'm telling the truth. So I'm going to bring God or my mother's grave or whatever into this. What were you going to say, Bob? Well, I've never been in a situation, but maybe some of you have. And it's always worried me that one day I might be in a courtroom where they'll say to me, uh, uh, put your hand on the Bible and repeat after me, I swear to God, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. And I have thought beforehand, if that ever happened to me, I would say, I refuse to swear by that Bible. Right. Because in that Bible, it says, blah, 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 Right. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that would be correct or not. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, and isn't it funny that that was established when we were more of a Bible-focused nation? So there's a conflict there. You know, I had a, a roommate that focused so much on the word swear that he would say, always say, as God is my witness, this is true. Because he didn't want to say, I swear to God. Like he would, but, and we were talking one day, and I'm all, that kind of is doing the same thing. And he, and he changed it after his freshman year, and he would say, my yes is my yes, this really happened today. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that one works. That or My no is my no, I never did that. So he used scripture to, to I mean, it was still kind of the same nature, but he wasn't swearing on anything. He was just, my yes is my yes, believe me. So yep. that might be a good alternative if someone is used to saying swear to God. Yep. My yes is my yes, trust me on this, you know, yep. so... Um, but anyway. <laughs> as, as you put in our notes here, I mean, the issue here with these oaths is that God himself, the creator, is being used by people as a means to an end, as a tool to manipulate people or situations or whatever it is. And that's an issue. You know, you are, 
especially when you think about as Christians and the way that we interact with each other, with the world, if you're going to call God's name into it, I had a teacher in high school who would always say, why do you have to bring God into this? Why can't you, you and me just talk? <laughs> why are you going to call God down into this argument? But it's, it's this idea, and I, I, it reminds me of the heart behind the not using the Lord's name in vain, not treating God's name as common. It's God is to be worshipped and revered, and you're treating him as common when you're bringing him into the pettier things, or even some things that are a bigger deal. But again, it's it's this heart behind it of, we see an example of Paul, where it was appropriate for him to say, I am standing before God, God is my witness, I am an apostle, I am giving you truth from God, and it was it was appropriate. Yeah. But what Jesus goes on to say, um, as Brent's friend did, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So yes be yes, no be no. This idea of living our lives in a way that when we say something, people do not doubt what we say. And, I mean, that's really difficult because sometimes all it takes is one time for people to not believe that is the case anymore Um, i'm sure all of us can think of people maybe in our childhood teenage years young adult wherever we are of people that if they told us no or told us yes we did not question have you had people that in your life they're they're just they live their life so truthful you know they're telling the truth if they say yes if they say no if they said they did this if they said this didn't happen you fully trust them and that's what Jesus wants. We, he wants us to be people that are so truthful and trustworthy and loyal that all we have to say is yes or no, and people know we're telling the truth because Christ works in us. That's what we want to strive to be, you know. Um, so a concluding question about this idea of being trustworthy as a Christian. Why, why, as a Christian, as a believer, is it important to be trustworthy. Why is this right next to adultery and murder? <laughs> because if you're not trustworthy, you're, you're a liar. And a liar, well, in Revelation 21 8, will send you to the lake of fire. There you go. Sin on sin. If you're not trustworthy and you're saying that you're a Christian, especially with not Christians around, how are they going to have to trust you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's the nail on the head. This is the example, you know. You're right. Yeah, right. Becky's saying if Becky's saying as as a Christian, if you're not truthful, especially to non-believers around you, why or why would anyone ever want Jesus? And that's that's a huge takeaway. One within the community of faith, not being trustworthy, it just it breaks down relationships. It's just it's not good. But when you think about our mission to this world and going out and preaching the gospel, if you are sharing Jesus with someone who doesn't believe that what you're saying is true just in the basic everyday things, why are they going to trust you with giving their heart and soul to Jesus? You know, and so it's just it's important on a relational level. It's important on an evangelistic level. Uh, It's important. And I think it's fair to say that these people are taking oaths on um, Jerusalem and heaven and God and all these things. And and some of those were legally binding. If you did a an oath on Yahweh in this culture, it was a legal promise. Like you were signing the contract. Mm-hmm. But things like Jerusalem and stuff, those were extra things people are adding well, I don't want to go as far to say I'm taking an oath that is legal, but I'm still taking an oath, trust me, you know. And mm-hmm. I think it's safe to say these people were breaking these oaths. They're making oaths and invoking God's holy city, um, the heavens, God's residence, mm-hmm. and then they're breaking these things and they're making more oaths using them. And it's just, and how many times... Um, have we have have people and even Christians say, "I swear to God," but they're kind of telling a half true, or they didn't give the full story, and then they'll say it again and they'll say it again, and 
it's just there's no well it's like taking god's name in vain you're mm-hmm. you're not giving it reverence that no. it deserves and you're making these oaths and there's it's just being used to manipulate people and and God has nothing to do with it. So. And, yeah. and also, God says we're not to swear neither heaven nor earth. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't it so. reveal your intent? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's what all the scripture is. Yeah, so you're right. That we talk to. So, so if we um, are not being honest, that reveals who we are. If we are being honest, that also reveals who we are. Yeah. So there shouldn't have to be anything beyond that. Yeah, that's right. And you think about it, the Testam- the the Ten Commandments, we break one down for kids that says do not lie, but it's don't give false testimony about all these things. Mm-hmm. Jesus is cutting that, you know, let's not wait to where you are in a position where you lie about something. Let's live a life that is so truthful that all you have to say is yes and no, and you're never going to get to a point where you're nope. giving these false oaths and false testimonies. So Good stuff. All right. We did it. 19 um, minutes. We did it. 18 minutes. Kathy, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight? Lord God, we just thank you for this evening that we gathered to hear your word, to learn a little more about you, Lord, and to know what your word says, how we are to live our lives, and how we're not to live our lives. That's right. Thank you, Father. We ask that you give those that are online um, insight as well as those that are here. Father, protect us as we go home. Bless us night and bless us in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good night, everybody. See ya.